Thank you so much, Secretary Roach. Welcome, everybody, to tonight's Penn Harris Madison Board of School Trustees meeting. It's wonderful to see you all. We see some returning faces being promoted up to new, new positions in our corporations. Wonderful always to see our students. Thank you guys so much for coming out for tonight. I also want to welcome everybody who's in our overflow area just outside the boardroom and extend a special welcome to those who are joining us via our live YouTube feed. It is seven o'clock on the dot. Call this meeting to order. And the first item on our agenda is the superintendent's recognitions and announcements. Dr. Thacker. Thank you, President Riley and Board of Trustees. Welcome everyone. It's great to see you. At this time, I'd like to introduce and welcome our outstanding student board ambassador for Penn High School, Mo Schaefer. I actually speak at these things now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, obviously, <clears throat> I want to start out with just a little wellness check. I would want to say I'm doing well, but unfortunately, I decided to fill out a March Madness bracket. Did not go so well for me. I had Auburn and Kentucky in my championship game. Thanks. They both lost first round, so I'm not doing so well. Hope your guys' brackets are doing better. I honestly thought the worst thing was going to be my team not making it because uh, the USC was pretty bad this year. I mean, but uh, no, no, it was worse. But uh, anyway, I'm actually doing okay. March Madness, I should probably stick away from. But uh, just a quick agenda for you tonight. We're gonna go through sports, fine arts, and then academics, and then just wrap it up. It's a bit of a, a bit of a long speech just because it's been a month since we last spoken. So a lot of things happen in a month, right? So first off with sports, um, for Penn Hockey's Quinn Coquit, he won the Indiana State High School Worlds Award for the Mental Attitude, which came with a thousand dollar scholarship. If you guys haven't read about his story, it's on the pennant. I'd highly recommend going to check it out. It's really an inspirational story, and especially with all the adversity he's had to gone through. Um, now moving on to boys basketball. Unfortunately, we did lose in the sectional championship. However, I did want to give a huge shout out to Coach Kuhlman and the rest of the guys out there. Um, obviously, losing your whole entire starting lineup and Indiana's Mr. Basketball is not an easy feat to recover from, especially you know when your head coach retires and you're taking over a program for the first time. I uh, thought that was pretty cool. And speaking of Mr. Basketball, he won ACC Rookie of the Year, which is pretty cool. You know, one of the local kids doing doing good stuff. What college did he attend? Not a, not a, not a solid one, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, their basketball team was bad as well, but I guess every Indiana basketball team is bad except Purdue, which I, I know you went to IU, Mr. Chaffee, but I'm still waiting for, for them to get back. But, um, <laughs> um, but when we go to girls basketball, Warren Walsh was selected to the Indiana All-Star team, which is pretty cool. Uh, I think this is their second year in a row, if I'm not mistaken. There's a shout out to her. And then the dance team, they placed fifth at the state. Bella Bauer won a state scholarship, which is amazing. And they actually traveled down to nationals, I believe for the first time in their history, if I'm not mistaken. And they placed 13th in the nation. So round of applause for that. That's really good. Um, from my time at Penn, I don't ever remember the dance team ever being that good. So it just goes to show like all the work we put in and the results we get. So huge shout out to the dance team. And then we have track and field, which is obviously the best sport because I do it, right? Uh, you know, <clears throat> so we did beat Mishawaka the other day, 98-34. But, I mean, we already knew we were going to beat Mishawaka because, you know, that's better. But what we're, what's actually important here is we actually set a school record in the 4 by one Elijah Coker, Cameron Anderson, Cohen Turner, and Kellen Watson set a new school record in the 4 by 100 with a time of 41.44 seconds. And I don't think this is going to be the first time they break the school record this year. So that was pretty exciting. Um, then we go on to football, which Penn legend Billy Summer is going to the Indiana Hall of Fame. And for those of you who don't know, he won state with Penn in 95 and 96. Pretty cool. He won a national title for Michigan, which was pretty cool. Unless you're a Notre Dame fan, then that might sting. But you guys have been relevant since the 80s. So. <laughs> he was also with the Packers, but I'm not a huge Packers guy. Uh, I don't think many people are Packers guys. But, you know. <laughs> anyway, also, also. Um, I think a little birdie told me that we have a new head football coach. Pete, Pete Oregon. Yeah, I heard he's pretty good. Um, I thought he was just going to be my AP Econ teacher next year. It's also going to be a football coach, I guess. So I'm looking forward to the AP Econ, maybe a few football games. But third head coach in 50 years, pretty important. Seventh of all time. I'm looking forward to seeing that. And you'll get to hear from him, what appears in a few minutes. So that's pretty exciting. So obviously we have all the sports. Great, lovely. But there's more to Penn than just sports. Let's move on to fine arts. So I actually attended a musical for the first time 
in my entire life. I'm not a huge musical person, but I attended the music band, which is the first time they played in 30 years. I hope you guys got to go see it. It was absolutely great. Um, I, I will say uh, some of the scenes were a bit graphic for me. AKA it was just a high school kissing scene. <laughs> um, no, it was cool. They actually put on a really good performance, uh, really good singing, really passionate actors, and you know, shout out to the directors of Mrs. Black and Mr. Nemeth and all the other directors. Really good musical. Um, also, the choir performed with the South Bend Youth Symphony Orchestra. Unfortunately, I did not get to attend that show, but I've heard it was really good from various sources, so that's pretty, pretty impressive. Also under fine arts, uh, student Maria, Maria Goffinet, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, actually won the Billy Michael Student Leadership Award, which means that she gets to go to New Orleans in the last weekend of May on an all-expense paid trip with different leaders all throughout the nation. And each person from each state only wins this one award. So that's pretty impressive that and out of all of Indiana students, she was she won that award. And she was nominated by teacher Eric Bowers. So round of applause to her. That's pretty good. <laughs> now, just on our last section, we have academics, which is, you know, Penn's forte. But obviously, we're really good at everything. But I like academics the best. So, you know. So when we go on to the academic Super Bowl, we have the Northbridge Invitational. We placed third in science and math, which is pretty solid. But in social studies, English, and fine arts, we all place first, so that's good. Humanities over STEM any any day of the week. But you guys already knew that for me because you know <clears throat> some some of us struggle with calculus. But <laughs> um, also also not just the students. We need to recognize the teachers once again. Uh, Mr. Riordan and Miss Dawkins won PHM Impact Awards, which deserves a huge shout out. She was either not only making a difference on the football field, but they're actually making a difference in the classroom, which is the most important thing, right? So when we actually go on to academic teams, first, let's start with the robotics team. They hosted their huge tournament March 2nd, March 3rd. It was great. I wasn't there. I was uh, busy at a speech tournament, but uh, I heard it was really good. Teams 135 and 238 were selected for playoff alliances. Really good. Um, on that tournament, Team 135 won the quality award. I'm not sure what that means, but I, what I read, when I read it, it basically just said that they are really good. I'm sure Dr. Keller can elaborate on that <laughs> if he really wanted to. I think he knows somebody on that team. So. Also, Team 135 won the Plainsville District Tournament, which is basically just their districts. So that was pretty exciting, pretty cool to see. Basically, the moral of the story today is a lot of pen domination, in case you didn't get that. Um, then we go on to DECA. We had 20 members qualify for ICDC. And then when we go on to state champs, we had Avaya Bell, Joel Bell, Matthew Deal, Stanley Liu, Amrit Carr, Rhea Rakara, and Cameron Pazanowski. I'm sorry, I mispronounced that. I'm awful at pronouncing names sometimes. But 20 members for ICDC, which I think takes place between April 25th and April 30th. So they're going to be down in Anna. They're actually going to go west to Anaheim. It's going to be a lot warmer than here, which would be nice. The weather's been awful this past month. <coughs> I hate running in it. So, And then lastly, we have the speech team. Uh, we placed second in the state in AAA, which is pretty exciting. Highest ever we've ever placed. And then fifth overall. Not as exciting as our state championship, but uh, it's second place in speech we do. So, And then lastly, we just have a quick student government news. What we did this uh, this past month for our like class competition was have a March Madness bracket, and the teachers absolutely love that. Usually, some of the teachers are kind of hesitant to like you know interact with it just because it's time consuming, takes away from class. But March Madness, all you had to do was fill out a bracket, pretty simple and e and easy. Everyone loved it. I mean, I didn't because my bracket's awful, but you know, students, teachers really liked it, so we were happy that we put that on. And uh, winning team, winning class will be announced after the tournament, obviously. Um, I was rooting for Yale, but unfortunately they, they choked last night. So I, I guess I'm going to go with the UConn or something. I, I don't know. Or NC State, just some underdog. But anyway, more of the story is I know it was a long speech. Penn's doing great. Um, and any, if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. But I look forward to seeing you guys on April 22nd at the best middle school, the Schmucker Middle School. So, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> Thank you, Noah, very much. Thank you, guys. You know, before we let you go, I, I'm getting to know more about you, notwithstanding your your taste in college athletics. But I didn't I didn't know that you're a track and field athlete. Too. I, I am a track and field athlete. What's yeah. your event? Uh, I actually do too. I'm an 800 runner and a 400 guy. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Very good. If you ever want to come out to me, I encourage you to come out. <laughs> Anyone, it's great. I, I think I shall. You're an all around talented guy. Well, thank you for the report. Please do pass along our congratulations to all the. Students who uh, were part of the DECA program, the robotics team, humanities, science, please tell Maria in arts, congratulations for her leadership award. Uh, thanks to all those participating in Music Man and congratulations on your track and field team and to all of our athletes who have accomplished so much since our last school board meeting. So we'll see you soon.
All right, Dr. Thacker, turn it back over to you. Thank you, President Riley and Board of Trustees. Well, something new, Griffin Middle School has a new program to recognize and inspire students. More than 62 students applied for their inaugural <coughs> program called the 14 Under 14 program. It's modeled after the South Bend Regional Chamber's 40 Under 40 program. And it recognizes students for their community involvement, student leadership, commitment to academics, entrepreneurial skills, and kindness toward others. On February 23rd, I had the pleasure of helping honor the students and their families at a special breakfast. Let's take a look. We have been accepting applications for 14 under 14. We had 62 students apply, and we have found our 14 recipients. 14 Under 14 is an award for Grissom Middle School students, and this is the first of its kind. We really modeled this after the South Bend Regional Chamber of Commerce 40 Under 40 Award. We have this opportunity to recognize students here at Grissom who are doing amazing things in their community, amazing things in their school. We wanted to celebrate and have more of a formal ceremony with the students and their families because families really help support their students, the parents, the grandparents, so that they can be all that they can be. You're the young people that we hope will look at pathways in our community, look at employers, explore. And I think that's our real goal at the Chamber is to show that there are so many opportunities out there for you to pursue. You know, at this age range, 11, 12, 13 years old, trying to see what impact you can have, it's kind of hard to visualize that sometimes. Yeah, it's a great honor to be able to get this award. I enjoy helping because helping, I know this is going to sound weird, it, it makes me feel good. It's, I, I'm able to help people that aren't able to help themselves. I'm so um, excited to have this honor to be named. I think this is like a really great like award we have to recognize those students who go above and beyond in school every day. This is a big milestone and a big deal that they won this award so that they can be celebrated with a crystal trophy and pictures. I'm hoping that that is inspirational to our students that you have the ability to make an impact. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Thacker. What a great video and what a great idea. Congrats to Jen Turnblom for coming up with that idea of the 14 under uh, 14 under 14 and for Jen St. Clair and congrats to all of our winners. That is a it's a great program. Thanks for the video, Dr. Thacker. And I know that uh, we're going to hear from Ms. Turnblom, so I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Thacker. Thank you, President Riley and Board of Trustees. So joining us tonight is our, our amazing Executive Director of the Penn Harris Madison Education Foundation, Ms. Jen Turnblom, who will present a report on the 2023 PHM Education Foundation grant cycle, as well as upcoming foundation programs and events. Welcome, Ms. Turnblom. Thank you so much, Dr. Thacker, President Riley, members of the board. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight and share some of the work that the foundation is doing. Um, I wanted to thank you first off for approving our grants um, during the grant cycle in, that we had in November uh, and give you an update on the programs and grants as they're being implemented in the schools. Um, we have a lot of programs going on in the spring, so just a quick update on a few of those. Um, and also, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone involved with this year's Young Authors Conference. Um, Candy Cusson, Jesse Kinney, and Josiah Parker worked to combine our Young Authors Conference with the Next Gen Robotics Day, creating a really cool day called Books and Bots. Um, we were able to offer that at no charge to any of our K through five students in the district. They came out, they got to meet an author, have their books signed, hear stories, and also try out a bunch of different robotics and STEM technology. A lot of those were through grants that the foundation has found funded. So it was really neat to see those grants in action and to see our students getting to enjoy those um, in person. We have our Pen Robotics, Gibson After School Tutoring for our Title I schools, the Kingsman Art Gallery, and Kindness to Prevent Blindness that are all just running throughout the year. Um, and then we have a couple other special spring events. We just wrapped up our spring jobs fair. Um, it was wonderful to have the entire junior and senior class 
of Penn come through. They got to hear talks on financial literacy and meet with over 60 businesses from the community that had available internships, job opportunities. They practiced their resume building skills and interviewing. I actually had some businesses come up and tell us that some of our junior class members asked better questions than adults that they've been interviewing. Mm -hmm. So it was really great to see um, just kind of the excellence of our students and our community and their excitement over their support. Um, we have running as elementary gearing up. We have gotten all the coaches signed up. We're looking forward to this program. Again, it's provided to all of our fourth and fifth graders at no charge to their families. Um, and it's just such a great day to see all of the schools come together in one big race. Um, we're so grateful to Cindy Batalis for kind of overseeing that whole program. And I'm very excited that on Wednesday, I will be going to one of the elementary schools to announce the winner of our t-shirt design contest. So this is something new we started last year and we um, allow our students to submit drawings. The winning design is then on all of the uh, t-shirts for all of the schools and featured for the race. So I'm very, very excited for that on Wednesday. Um, and then I, oh, and also the Eclipse glasses um, have been distributed to all of the schools and those will be going home with staff and students before <coughs> spring break. So we're thrilled that we were able to provide those for everyone district-wide. Um, I wanted to give an update on the grants. I know the board has seen the grant report um, in the fall before when it was approved before we awarded those, but we, I wanted to kind of give you an update on how those have been implemented in some of the classrooms. Um, we funded $39,501.17 in traditional grants and $3,318.46 in easy grants. We did one combined big grant cycle this year. Um, and it was, it was just amazing to be able to provide so many things. So I wanted to highlight just a few things. One of the pictures you'll see up there, the t-shirt, um, was one of our easy grants and their crisis prevention shirts for the Penn High School counselors. It has the Safe School Helpline and the suicide prevention information on the shirts. Um, so we were actually, the grant was able to fund two t-shirts for every Penn High School counselor. Um, and that grant was written by Stacy Eck, who's one of the counselors at Penn High School. Um, and then we funded some other really exciting grants and those have been getting into all of the schools as people get them ordered. Um, for three of the elementary schools, we provided a phonics system um, that they had tried through our grant cycle last year at Elsie Rogers. And it was a huge success just talking about, um, it's called The Secret Stories and it's phonics books about relationships between letters. Like these two letters are friends and it really gives the kids kind of excitement and they tie in an emotional aspect mm -hmm. to the stories and they just have an easier time learning when they're learning about these cute stories that they all enjoy. Um, so it was really successful and we were able to provide those for Walt Disney, Bittersweet and Elm Road. Um, another grant that I was really excited about was the washer and dryer we funded for Elm. Um, and that just helps students whose families don't have access to laundry to get their needs met. And the teachers have already gotten that installed in the building and they said that it is in use every day. Um, so I'm thrilled that we're able to kind of meet that need for our students. Um, and then another, we had a couple of really great grants for the high school as well. One of those was actually a student-led grant. They worked with their teachers to start a hygiene closet. Again, just meeting the needs of their peers and making it so they can have basic self-care and hygiene products. Um, and that's something that we're kind of looking into helping community partners come in and sponsor and support as well as, it, as time goes on. Um, but we were able to give them the funding to get it off the ground and get it fully stocked um, to start the year. On the STEM side, um, we funded a project called Kingsman Carting Through STEM, and that is working with students in the engineering de and design and the industrial maintenance classes, having them work together to build two uh, actual functional go-karts. I'm optimistic that they might let us use it for the homecoming parade, <laughs> so we'll see. I'm keeping my fingers crossed on that one. Um, and then the 
we also funded uh, materials for called Let's Win Gold for a jewelry making class to get started in art classes at Penn because the art teacher had shared that that's something that students that are maybe less creative and like more structure can design jewelry and do it in a more functional way um, and use their skills and get get some make some beautiful pieces. Um, we also funded a greenhouse project for Walt Disney, and that is getting off the ground. They're getting the greenhouse built and then partnering, um, again, with some local community businesses to provide seeds and soil and things like that so that students can start planting um, and learn about different environmental sciences, as well as growing some functional fruits and vegetables, things like that for their families. Um, and then the last one I just wanted to highlight because I thought this was a really neat idea. It's called the TD Snap app. And this was this grant was written by one of our speech and language pathology teachers. And it's for an app um, with a voice output communication aid for nonverbal students or students with speech impairments. So it can help them increase their communication skills and kind of give them a voice. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a few of those. All of our grants are always on our website with details about all of them. Um, like I said, I know you've all seen them before, but I just wanted to come in, see if I could answer any questions, give you some updates. And then I also wanted to share that we have the superintendent's breakfast coming up on May 15th. Dr. Thacker will be there as our keynote speaker sharing things going on in the district. Um, we will get to recognize all of our grant recipients from this year which it really is just so special to me that these teachers take the time to not only come up with these ideas for their students, but that they write these grants and they're so excited to put them to work in their classroom. And I just, it's a really special morning to recognize them. Tickets are on sale now on our website. Um, obviously all the school board receives your invitations in the mail. So keep an eye out for those May 15th at St. Joe Farms. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all there too. Looking forward to seeing you too. Board members, any questions or comments? As always, you're doing a wonderful job. The Education Foundation is a great component of our school district. Thank you for all the innovation, all the ideas, and all the grants that you're bringing to the table. It's working wonders. Look Thank forward you. to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Tucker, I think we have another big announcement. <laughs> okay, this is an announcement which we've had a press conference. We've had lots of unbelievably favorable feedback and we're so excited to be recommending Pete Reardon to be the next Penn High School football coach. He's going to be phenomenal. I'll ask athletic director for Penn High School Jeff Hart to do a formal introduction. Dr. Thacker, President Riley, School Board of Trustees, I appreciate you guys letting me come here tonight. Um, Noah, I probably should have had you do this for me here. but. Uh, <laughs> But you guys stuck with the old guy. But um, I, I, last May, when I was introducing our outstanding new volleyball and, and boys basketball coaches uh, in this room, I mentioned that my four children, along with eight nieces and nephews, uh, were blessed to grow up in the PHM community. Several of them were fortunate to be taught by our newest head coach in the athletic family, a man who I'm excited to introduce tonight. The, uh, my relatives, like so many others that I've heard from, loved him as a teacher, challenged him, supported him helped them foster their interest in lifelong learning. <clears throat> None of them played football at Penn, American football, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but they did leave this place prepared because they had dedicated, positive, high character teachers who cared about their immediate success in the classroom, but also about their future after they left our high school. To me, that's a description of elite teaching and, and elite coaching. Finding those talented, unique individuals who can positively change lives is always the mission of our department when we begin the official process of finding a new coach. In this case, our committee was patient, prepared to find a new coach who would be a positive leader of young people, who is competitive, understands that Penn football plays an important role in our school and our community. Coach who will push student athletes to be the very best version of themselves on and off the field. Coach who wins with humility loses with grace, a coach who will do what they can <clears throat> to provide a positive experience for the young men he leads. I'm confident we found that head coach. I'm confident that he will leave a legacy that we can all be proud of. Simply put, Coach Pete Rudin is a winner. He won a state title as a high school football player. Uh, as a coach, he was part of our 2001 basketball staff that was state runner up. A few short months later, uh, won a state title as a member of our baseball staff. 
His 20 years of success coaching football and teaching at both Penn and Ben Davis, learning from Hall of Fame coaches like Coach Yeoman and Coach Giesman here at Penn, but also Coach Kirshner at Ben Davis have helped him prepare for this moment. I'm excited to support and work with Pete as he takes over this role in our school and in our community. Please help me welcome Coach Pete Reardon. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Dr. L Thacker, Dr. Linsky, uh, the School Board of Trustees, uh, the Penn High School Administration led by Dr. Gallagher, the Athletic Department by, by Jeff, uh, for this incredible opportunity. Uh, throughout this process, all levels of the administration have been incredibly supportive. Uh, the support has and will continue to help this transition for me uh, become easier. Uh, I also want to thank Coach Corey and Coach Corey Yeoman and Coach Chris Giesman for their insights and help not only through this process, but over my years of coaching with both of them. Uh, it's really difficult to quantify how much one can learn from these two. Uh, and you guys know that. Uh, it's, it's impressive. Uh, finally, I must thank my family, uh, my wife, Nicole, and my daughters, Natalie and Claire, uh, who have been very supportive and excited for the years to come. Uh, this is an, an opportunity that comes with high expectations and lots of responsibility. Uh, these high expectations are for success both on the field and off the field. Uh, I'm fully aware of how much Penn football means to everybody in this community. Uh, it's a very, very special uh, situation. Um, you know, the number of alumni that have reached out, former players, uh, current players, uh, coaches, uh, alumni, you know, players I had, you know, graduated well before I got here, uh, that support has been outstanding. And I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I look forward to meeting these expectations, uh, continue to keep, the, keep Penn football special and make an alumni proud of the long black line. So thank you very much for this, this opportunity. Thank you. I think uh, Dr. Rivera is she a Hall of Famer? She Thank is. Students, the teachers, and parents. Boy, is this a perfect example. He's talking about the mentors that Coach Reardon mentioned. You look at his family. And so we look at the, in this certain situation, those wonderful young competitive daughters that he has. They're going to do a great job. We were just so delighted to have you as, as uh, the next head coach. So you're going to have a great time. So congratulations again. Coach, on behalf of the board, congratulations on your recommendation. We'll take it up in just a minute for a vote, but we appreciate you so much and everything that you're doing at Penn High School. You're a great leader for our kids. And it, by the way, anybody who's already presented, if you, you're you welcome to stick around for the full business portion of the meeting, but you don't have to. Now would be a good time to leave. We can pause for a moment. <laughs> 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 okay, next up on the agenda is the adoption agenda. Board members, any suggested changes? Hearing none, administration? No changes. Before I call for a vote, we do have a member of the public who was asked to speak on the adoption of the agenda. So with the three-minute limit, Mr. Ben Dallas will recognize you. Well, hi there. So I'm Ben Dallas. I have four kids go to the school. I live here in Mishawaka. Um, the item I would like to add to the agenda would be approval of the arrest and detainment of three school board members, 
sounds kind of crazy, right? Not really. So if I stood here and if I broke policy, say I spoke more than three minutes, what would happen to me? I'd be arrested. I'd be detained. So violate the school policy. We've seen it happen. Sorry. We've seen it happen in this room. So I think when we violate our own policies, the same punishment should go for everybody. So I think um, Mr. Chris Riley, um, Claire Roach, and McCullough, who's not here, should all be arrested and detained for violating school policies. What are those policies? Well, the first one is um, policy 0144.3. It's also known as the conflict of interest policy. So for months now, since about October, I think, these three board members have been voting, okay, against something that was really in their own personal interest. I'll read the policy for you out loud. So it says, when a member of the board, of the, the board of school trustees, determines the possibility of a personal interest or conflict exists, he or she should, prior to the matter being considered, disclose his or her interests in accordance with statute and therefore shall ab abstain from participation in both the discussion of the matter and the vote that happens. So last I checked, you guys have been voting against a third-party investigation and the conduct on me. Well, that involves you guys, okay? That involves what you guys did to me. That's a conflict of interest. That's one policy. The other policy, okay, is called um, 0122. It's called board powers. Okay, board powers, it says this. The school board members have no authority over school affairs as individuals. I'm old enough to remember Claire Roach saying that this board acts in consent. That's why we have the consent agenda, okay? So they have the authority over school affairs only when acting as a board of school trustees. So which consent item was it? They had McCullough contact my employer about school affairs. Which consent item was it that Claire Roach talked to my state representative and told them stories about me that the police had to validate and they had to actually vindicate me and debunk it? Okay, that wasn't a consent item that was voted on last I checked, but those were individual act actions that were taken against me. Okay, so those are two policies that were broken. And we, and we all know what happens if I break a policy. If any of the parents, anybody behind me, if they break a policy, if they use inflection in their voice, they can get police investigations launched into them. They can be detained. They can be arrested. So it's good for the goose. It's good for the gander. Let's have fair policy all the way around. That's all I got. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Downs. Board members, do I have a motion to adopt the agenda for the Monday, March 25, 2024, regular board meeting as presented? I so move. Second? Second. All those in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed, vote nay. 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 We'll show four ayes as being Ms. Sullivan, Ms. Roach, Mr. Beeler, and Mr. Riley. One nay being Mr. Garrett, and one abstention being Mr. Chaffee. Move on to the approval of minutes. Board members, any additions or changes to the minutes from the February 26, 2024 executive session and regular board meeting? Administration? The administration has no changes. Then do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the February 26, 2024 <coughs> executive session and regular board meeting as presented? I so move. I second. All those in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed, vote nay. Motion carries unanimously. Move on to item six on the agenda, which is a policy approval revision. Dr. Thacker. Thank you, President Riley and Board of Trustees. Board Attorney Jeff Johnson will explain the proposed revisions of bylaw 0166.1. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Thacker, President Riley, and members of the board. Um, as Dr. Thacker indicated, there's a proposed revision to bylaw 0166.1 entitled Consent Agenda, which is scheduled for a reading this evening. The proposed revision to this bylaw would require that the motion of a board member to remove an item from the consent agenda be seconded and then approved by a majority of the board members in attendance at the meeting. Failure to receive a second or approval of a majority of the board will result in failure of the motion. Board members, any discussion? Uh, is this a discussion or an action? 
it's a it's an action item. I'm calling to see if there are any questions. So what, oh, absolutely. Uh, are, are there anyone that signed up first? Or are you gonna? Okay, so I we can't hear from if the public has any comments and we can't respond to it. You want us to speak, and then if there's no if there's parents that have signed up, we can't respond to that. Just like we can't respond to what Mr. Dallas said. I'm not sure what you're asking me. There, I, there, this goes back to the February 12th meeting, Mr. There, Riley. I'm, Mr. Chaffin, very, there is nobody who signed up to okay, speak perfect. on I, this particular yeah, agenda. That's item. what I'm, ask, I'm okay. asking. There's nobody who signed up. So okay, I'm asking first, if the board wants to discuss. Then I ask questions myself. I'm okay, just, go ahead. You're recognized okay. to discuss the policy. Well, yes. what, what's the need for this change? What, what, why all of a sudden did this change? I can't speak for all the school board members, but having somebody unilaterally withdraw 17 items off the consent agenda for no good reason at all, having no questions about it and not prepared to vote no on any one of the items on the consent agenda is a good reason to make the policy change. Just so the public's aware, consent agenda items are so routine that they don't really require much discussion. It's payment of ordinary bills and things that really don't require a presentation to the board and to the public. We don't want to have that waste of time because we have other business that we need to get through. Waste of time. These are things we're approving. We're spending in some casing cases millions of dollars, thousands of dollars, and you want don't want to discuss potential items and you want to label them waste of time. It's my time now. I, I let you speak. The reason, as was clearly stated at the February 26 board meeting. President Riley, why I did that was at the February 12th board meeting, a parent spoke at that podium. Her name is Anastasia Glassberg. She brought up valid concerns. I wanted to ask questions following up on those concerns. You prevented me from speaking and forced a vote. That is accessible on YouTube. Anybody that wants to question what I'm stating right now, go back and watch the February 12th meeting and then watch the February 26th meeting. Both meetings in February. I brought that up at the February 26th meeting. It's a clear solution. You let, if the public has signed up to speak, because nobody tells all the board members, at least they don't tell me, just like no one talked to me about this change in policy. All I saw is Thursday night, like usual, you guys provide it. This is what we're doing. All that said to us is board attorney Jeff F. Johnson will explain this <clears throat> item, Mr. Johnson. No other feedback. And now in response, you're probably going to say you could have reached out. Well, that's correct. But tell me a time where you've ever shown some type of back and forth in agreement. There was a clear. There was a clear violation of the public's goodwill in not allowing board members to speak that they elected into these seats at that February 12th meeting. I had simple questions that I wanted to ask. And I brought that up February 26th. And it's fair questions. And the change in this policy here tonight goes against our board policies. So you just said it's an action item. Well, there has not been a first reading. Policy number 1311-131.1, 131.1, 131.1, and 131.3. All talk about board policy adoption. Where was the first reading? There wasn't one. This is how you respond. That you silence parents, you silence board members who want to be critical. All I had was questions, and all I and I brought that up to the public on February 26 and say, hey, simple fix. You switch it. If someone signs up, you let us ask questions because it's a fair point. Consent agenda and items are supposed to be so you can move the meeting along. I do agree with that. But what happens if there's concerns on one of those items tonight? For example, we have on the consent agenda 28 items. What if I have an issue with one of those items? <clears throat> I can't vote no on that one item. I have to abstain. Because if I vote no on that, that one item, if this policy passes, then I have to vote no on all 28. That's why I abstained on February 12th. And I think I made that really clear on February 26th. And it just boggles my mind throughout 
the majority of me talking, you can't even look me in the eye and you're the board president and you smile when point, I say that. Point of order, this is becoming very personal. And I do think Robert's rules of order tries oh. to minimize yeah, but the let, personalization, let make the, the, <clears throat> the word is personalities, try and prevent back and forth. Yeah. Okay. That becomes that excessively personal. personal was not looking at me in the eye. So that that's okay. neither here nor there. Neither here nor there. You can't do this tonight based on our own board our, our own board policies. So I think that's correct. I may I we, take can we get a legal opinion on that? My understanding is bylaws can be revised, but policies have to have a first and second right. reading. We have we have done that in the past and under certain circumstances done the first reading and approved it. Um so it, it had, there is precedent for that. May have been a couple of years ago, but um, we have in the past. So your legal opinion is it can be voted on tonight. It can be, yes. Is the bylaw? Uh, by by oh, by I, I, I think that Ms. Roach asked to speak. So I, I would like to clarify that you I'll come can, back to you. Don't worry. You can <clears throat> still request that an item on the consent agenda be removed from the consent agenda, correct? Sure. That's my reading of it, but you need a second and you need a vote of the entire board. So if any of us have any concerns about anything on the consent agenda, we can still work to have that taken off so that it's a point of discussion. Um, so it doesn't preclude the board, any board member, it just requires that there be consensus. Again, limiting the powers of individual board members that have been elected by the people. Nothing new for the leadership leadership of the school corporation. Mr. Garrett, did you want to say something? I did, yeah. Um, how long has this uh, bylaw been in effect? Anyone know? Do you know? <clears throat> no. Years, right? Yes, my years. So in all these years it's been in effect, it's the first time there's ever been an issue like this, correct? As far as I know. Exactly. So after one time, after all these years and one time, and then you just automatically, uh, you scorch third theory, let's get rid of the policy. I know it's worked, it's worked for all these years we've had before. And I, I would suggest that if you have a situation where you didn't agree with Mr. Uh, uh, Chaffee what he did, why don't you go to Mr. Chaffee and talk to him and say, hey, this is not gonna work if you're trying to continue to do this. Are you, are you planning on doing this in, in the future? And if he's gonna keep doing it, then maybe do something about it. But if it's a one-time thing, and you know, uh, let's just you know let it go. If it happens again, maybe we consider it. But if it's happened once in the eight years I've been on the board, it probably never happened before that. So let's don't make a big deal out of it. Let's say, okay, we, it's not going to work if we keep doing it that way. If you keep doing it, we'll probably have to make a change. But at this point, I don't see why we have to jump to the from zero to 100 miles an hour over one issue. It, it, and agreed with you on that, Mr. Garrett. I did sp speak with Mrs. Roach last Sunday afternoon, not this past Sunday, but a week ago Sunday. And I told her on the phone, simple fix, just have President Riley allow board members, if parents sign up to speak or any community members speak about issues they have with something, hey, allow board members to comment. And it's a simple fix. It's that simple. That's all I ask. Told Mrs. Roach that eight days ago. And clearly, um, well, we're here tonight, pretty much silencing me. Uh, I, I just think I used my whole three minutes. Uh, I have one other thing. So what else do you want to say? Go ahead and say uh, it. Yeah, uh, this consent agenda, you're right. It is supposed to move things along. And I agree that to a certain degree. And most of the stuff, it's, it's a no brainer. But when you start putting in all these things, have these contracts with this and this uh, group, and we had a person uh, last uh, board meeting uh, did some research and found that one of the people uh, doing one of the uh, in services uh, was a uh, uh, had a way left wing lunatic uh, uh, political agenda. Uh, so some of that stuff, if you just go over it and there's no uh, uh, opportunity to uh, you know to vote against it, you know that stuff can slide through. I would suggest that if there's one issue, maybe instead of you know, maybe knocking out the whole agenda, maybe we can take one thing and say, let's table that because we've done that before in the past. I had an issue a few uh, meetings ago with a particular item and Dr. Thacker tabled that. So at least we, uh, and then we voted on it at a later time, but at least we had a chance to go over it and, and, and look at it without having being, you know, kind of shoved down our throat uh, 
in a consent agenda. I clearly remember that. And I appreciated the way that you brought it up. You brought it up in executive session before the school board meeting began, gave us all an opportunity to understand where you're coming from. And then we all agreed, okay, well, let's take it off and let's have further discussion about it. I would like to keep that. I think you did it the right way. Instead of waiting for the school board meeting to begin, and then implicitly out of just being vindictive, wait for this consent agenda to, to be called. That's a little personal. Little personal. Yeah. I understand that, but we can't allow the consent agenda to be taken, every item on the consent agenda to be taken off the consent agenda purely to be vindictive. It's a waste of time. It is a an issue that the school board now has an opportunity to close. Mr. Garrett, I've never seen it. I've never seen that done. I've never seen it done either. And I don't think that it should be done. The door is still open that if a school board member like you did has a problem with it, one or more of the items, bring it to us ahead of time. Don't wait until the school board meeting begins. Give us an opportunity to do a little bit of research and understand what you're saying, and then we take it off. Still, even with this policy, if somebody has a problem with it, go to your fellow school board members. All right, so there you go. So we don't even have to deal with this because now we kind of uh, solved the problem. For school board members, yeah. if parents speak, you just silence them and we serve them. I don't serve you. And it clearly, in my opinion, you're ramming through this policy. Doesn't sound like Jeff is that conf confident in what he stated, he hasn't set, set specific examples of that precedent. Um, sounds ambiguous to, it, to the bare minimum. Um, and in my opinion, you're silencing parents. My, my big thing was if parents or community members, anyone speaks something we weren't aware of, hey, people have lives outside of school board meetings and being here and being able to read this in time to be at a school board meeting, if they come and speak, and one school board member wants to remove it because they still want to vote yes on everything else, but they want to vote no, or maybe have further discussion on the one item that should be done. But, and it sounded like based on my conversation with Mrs. Roach, we had a healthy conversation, I would say, I, at least I thought it was on my end uh, last Sunday. I thought we had an agreement um, on that. Um, thought it would be relayed. Clearly it wasn't for President Riley just doesn't want to play ball, which I think it's the latter. Any other school board members have anything to say? I would suggest that we consider it as a first reading and go through the process through the second reading. Okay. Mm -hmm. I agree, Larry. Okay, Mr. Well said, Larry. All right. We will then table this for tonight we will consider this for purposes of the minutes as having had a first reading and we'll bring it up for a vote at the next school board meeting okay that brings us to the consent agenda itself dr thacker the administration recommends approval of the 28 items appearing on the consent agenda appearing on the personnel report or certified staff Retirement of assignments. We have seven retirements at the end of the school year. Susan Lestinsky, teacher at Mary Frank with 31 years of outstanding service. Julie Adams, teacher at North Point with 36 years of outstanding service. Maria Trowbridge, teacher at Penn High School, will retire with 40 years of outstanding service. Cheryl Saverell, teacher at Moran, will retire after 41 years of outstanding service. Teresa Bezeski, teacher at Mary Frank, will retire after 43 years of service with 33 years in PHM. We appreciate her outstanding work. Scott Thompson, Penn High School, teacher, 17 years of outstanding service, and Sherry Jackson, teacher at Penn High School, retire with 12 years of service and 11 of those years she's making outstanding contributions in Penn High School. On behalf of the Board of Administration, we wish all of these outstanding colleagues the very best in their upcoming retirements. Thank you, Dr. Thacker. Board members, any questions or comments? We do have a member of the public who has requested to speak on the consent agenda. So for a three minute limit, I'll rec recognize Christy Witt. Hi, my name is Christy Witt. I live in Granger, you have my address. Um, so I'm speaking on something that I think uh, you're referencing. So it doesn't really matter what I say, but 
7.12, you are um, trying to approve development for safe and civil schools, an overview of CHAMP's practice and positive approach, which, which is classroom behavior. Um, on the website, it states to improve safety, discipline, performance by embracing restorative practices and capturing the hearts of kids. So you don't do anything with restorative practices. You're not doing anything with culturally relevant teaching or CRT, but here we are. This presenter is going to get paid $6,000 per day plus travel expenses and the required materials the school has to pay for. So I don't know how many books you are going to be paying for, but $6,000 per day sounds like we're all in the wrong business. You keep adding programs, but can't do the basic task of enforcing your own guidelines and rules. Being so wishy-washy on the school's rules fostered this environment, which equals no authority and no trust. In fact, you deny we have a behavior problem. You keep throwing money at programs to fix the kids, but no information as to why the last fabulous program didn't work. It seems like this falls under Dr. Sears and Mr. White's job description. So why do six-figured employees need experts coming in to teach it? As a parent, where on your website can I find outcomes on reflection rooms and equity webinars and data collecting? You pretend Mr. Garrett is off his rocker and you have no idea what he's talking about when he brings up issues in the classroom. Your own Ms. Sullivan gaslighted him at the last meeting by acting like he said teachers should never try to better themselves. So here's, I'm talking to you, Mr. Riley. Well, again, you yeah, can personalize it by calling her name. Okay, so a school board school member address. did. Ma'am, ma can I just interrupt yeah. a second? When you're addressing the board, you're addressing the board as a whole, okay. not individual members. Okay, so one of the members reached, said to one of the members that, that he is um, acting like he said teachers should never try to better themselves. So here's one of many behavior management systems that you'll try to implement. Programs that are incidentally are, are related to restorative justice and ties to Marxism and racial injustices, all stemming from the 2020 resolution. So $6,000 per day, at least for classroom management. Today, there's a video from Discovery going around of a violent fight where a teacher gets knocked to the ground. It's unacceptable. I'm sure there was an email to parents and students saying, do not share it with the community. That's unacceptable. Because what are you trying to hide? That should be shown everywhere. And these kids should be done. Zero tolerance. It's time to start a middle school Penwick. These teachers and kids who witnessed that should never, ever have to think this is just normal everyday life. I've seen the video. And again, a kid getting eight chances, getting thrown in a reflection room to have a juice box and play Xbox and reflect on what they did after they just beat a teacher or knocked a teacher to the ground and just beat a student is unacceptable. I have asked in previous meetings to start a middle school Penway. And I think, again, throwing thousands of dollars, $6,000 per day on, a, on someone outside the room, you have a lot of people that are very talented that can do it themselves. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Witt. All right, um, board members, any further comment on the consent agenda? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve March 25, 2024 consent agenda as presented by Dr. Thacker? All those in favor vote aye. 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 Any opposed vote nay. Motion carries unanimously. Before moving on to our next agenda item, Dr. Thacker, you got some additional comments to share? I do indeed. Thank you, President Raleigh, Board of Trustees. Really excited to introduce Mr. Bob Thompson, who's going to be our new Director of Human Resources. As we mentioned in February at the board meeting, Dr. Lisa Soda Kyle is retiring effective June 30th of this year. Uh, the board and I want to thank Dr. Soda Kyle for outstanding leadership throughout her career at Penn Harris Madison. Why don't you stand up, Dr. Soda Kyle? How about a round of applause? <laughs> Mr. Thompson has served in a number of roles, most recently as Director of Alternative Education and Special Projects since 2021. During this time, he's also overseen the Kids Club and PHM's English as a New Language program. Uh, Mr. Thompson began his career in education in 2000. He's been at PHM for almost 16 years. He began in 2008 when he was hired as an assistant to the principal for Elsie Rogers Elementary School. Then he became the principal at Elsie Rogers, a position he held for three years, then became principal at Bittersweet, from 2012 to 2021. He's also simultaneously served as an adjunct professor with Bethel University in graduate education since 2015. He served on various committees within PHM, mentored up and coming administrators. Bob is a Penn alum receiving the Penn High School Distinguished Alumni Award and Teacher of the Year at Battelle Elementary when he began as a teacher in the school city of Mishawaka. 
before he came into education, he was a vice president and operations manager at Thompson Aluminum. And Mr. Thompson received his degree in elementary education with a computer concentration as well as a master's in elementary education administration from IU South Bend. Bob was also honored with the IU South Bend's Outstanding Future Educator Award. Mr. Thompson, please come forward. Say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Thacker, President Riley, board members. Uh, that is one long resume, isn't it? <laughs> but <laughs> I am thrilled. What's that? It's a left out half. Yeah. Uh, it is a thrill to be here uh, to continue my journey and our commitment to excellence in PHM. I've enjoyed all my positions here, and I appreciate this, uh, this new journey that I've been asked to uh, complete. I want to thank Dr. Soto Kyle and her HR staff, um, as well as our learning division, our cabinet, everyone that has offered to help onboard me and orientate me to this job. And um, my personal motto is always making a difference in one's lives. So I hope to continue to do that by retaining and recruiting the very best that we can here at PHM. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Congratulations. Let's have our picture taken with you. I know you probably have 8,000 of these. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, no. Okay. You a great job. Well, congratulations again, Mr. Thompson, and thank you, Dr. Lisa Soto Kyle, for all that you've done. Can we have a departing word of or hand for her and all of her efforts too? Of our you guys have uh, both done an excellent job throughout your career here at uh, PHM, and we appreciate you. Before we move on, uh, Dr. Thacker, it's always sad to see so many retirements. Um, and all of our retirees, of course, deserve a shout out. I just want to give one real special shout out to somebody who's never really asked for any recognition, despite having 41 years at Moran. That's pretty impressive. Uh, Cheryl Satterall, Godspeed to you. God bless you for everything that you've done for Moran. Um, you were a life, you have been a lifelong learner. You've taught a love for learning to your students. I know that your love for learning is infectious and they caught it. And we wish you nothing but the best in your retirement. We hope you have a wonderful one. Congratulations for being recognized for the earned Candace Dodson Influencer Award and Technovation is just a mere symbol of all that you've accomplished. So we wish you all the best. And we wish Godspeed to all of our retirees as well. So we'll move on to action item number eight, Dr. Thacker. Thank you, President Riley and Board of Trustees. This is really a great opportunity. We're trying to we want to create a preschool expansion at Meadows Edge, and that's because we, for us to receive the funding, we have to, to do this. So we're going to be explaining that tonight. So Dr. Shore, Assistant Superintendent, Director of Professional Development Student Learning, Dr. Levon D. Null, and Director of Literacy in Title I, Mr. Ryan Towner, are going to give us an update on student progress and instructional support. So we're going to discuss the progress that's been made with our Science of Reading grant from the Indiana Department of Education Spotlight that gets your teach on partnership at Walt Disney, which is a phenomenal <coughs> opportunity, and share information about our preschool pilot at Madison. We're also planning for that expansion that I mentioned at the preschool academy at Meadows Edge. Additionally, the administration recommends that the board approve reconfiguring the grade levels at Meadows Edge to include the preschool, which is <coughs> one of our statutory requirements. And I'll turn this over to Dr. Short. Thank you, Dr. Thacker. Good evening, and President Riley, members of the board. Uh, we are excited to share this evening with you and give an update from the perspective of the learning division. Uh, so we are going to go ahead and go through a little bit of data for you. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about reading, math, um, our plans and some visions that we have. We're going to talk about our earliest learners, and then we are going to highlight the Get Your Teach On spotlight that we have going on at Walt Disney and the remarkable grant that we were um, 
lucky to receive from them. So we're excited to talk about that with you this evening. So uh, just a quick snapshot of data. Um, you know, you hear us talk all the time of the importance of both formative and summative data and what we utilize that information for. So these are just two graphs. We could have we could have pulled a lot of different information for you, but we thought we would be um, we could summarize it pretty quickly with with these two areas this evening. Uh, at the top, you see our Dibbles growth outcomes. Dibbles is the pre-literacy or on the way to literacy assessment that we give all of our students in grades kindergarten, first and second. So the very top bar you see is our kindergarten aggregate scores. And that is scores that they took for middle of the year Dibbles. So what it shows you is the growth composite from the beginning of the year when we first assessed them when they came into our school as kindergartners to where they are at the middle of the year. And as you can see, um, if you look at just the top two components, the above average and the well above average charts, we are doing incredibly well with our kindergartners at over 72% of those students scoring above or well above average. Does that mean that they are necessarily at grade level? No, it doesn't. But what it means is if we don't chart that growth a long time, we are never going to get them to grade level. So critically important that our teachers are able to identify where students are, what needs, what skills need to be built in, and then move them along that continuum. So our kindergarten scores are outstanding, and that is an absolute testament to our kindergarten teachers. As you know, kindergarten students come in with the greatest width in terms of skills as they approach us for the very first time. Um, so as the second bar graph you'll see is that's the same uh, assessment. So those are our first graders. And again, if you look at the above average and well above average growth, we are still close to 60% of our students. Um, so that's not even just talking average and higher. We're talking above average and well above average. So again, um, you can tell that our, our teachers are focusing very, very intently on what the beginning of the year data looks like and what skills they need to address in order to continue to move those students. And again, the third chart would be our second graders. And we also have great movement there. 45% um, of our second graders have moved as well from above average to well above average. So again, we are we're happy to see this growth. We're going to talk a little bit more about our letters program and how we know that that's going to compound and we're going to continue to see growth there. Um, but we're very, very excited about what we're seeing out of our kindergarten, first and second grade classrooms related to early literacy. Mrs. Roach, do you have a question? So I just have, I, I see that the second grade bar is still an overwhelmingly positive result in terms yes. of how well our students are growing. But do you have any sense for why you feel like there's a little bit um, well, there's a larger percentage of well below average and below average in our second graders. Is so, it just the complexity of the language that they're learning in sec second grade? Or? It is. So that's where we start to really expand a little bit more to comprehension as opposed to just the phonemics, phonemic awareness strands and things that are that are pre-literacy skills. Okay. So. so then the bottom chart, I'm going to talk about a different assessment. That is what we use called ClearSight. You've heard us speak about that before. Um, ClearSight is an assessment that's given in third through eighth grade in both language arts and mathematics, and that is a predictor of um, assessments in terms of what I learned should look like. So again, this is from beginning of the year data to our middle of the year data. We give this test twice a year, and if you look at our third grade, the blue bar that you see is growth increases in proficiency in third grade language arts. So that tells us that nearly 25% of our third graders, 25% more, are predicted to pass iLearn based on the instruction and interventions that have happened in the fall of this year. That is a considerable. I, okay, so I number. wondered what the meaning of this graph was. Mm -hmm. Can I just state that to make sure I'm totally clear? Yes. These, these bar graphs represent how many more students are on track to pass iLearn. That is accurate. So growth in As proficiency. As compared to the beginning of the year? That's correct. Okay. That is correct. So if you look at the third grade math, you see that bar graph represents about 29% more students in third grade math predicted to pass the assessment. Fourth grade language arts is about 19. Fourth grade math is about 18. Fifth grade math is about 17. I'm sorry, fifth grade reading is 17. Fifth grade math is 30. Sixth grade language arts is 11. Sixth grade math is 11. 
Seventh grade and language arts is about six. Seventh grade math is about 13. Eighth grade math is about 10. And eighth grade, I'm sorry, eighth grade language arts is about 10. And eighth grade math is about 17. So you do see fluctuations in those numbers. And again, we talk about the importance of growth and how critical it is to make sure that our, our teachers are able to specifically target areas of growth as well as continue to watch the areas of deficiency so that we can continue to build plans. So while we are incredibly proud of the growth that our students have made, that's only a component of the picture because we can tell by that information that there's areas that we still need to fill in and we need to work very diligently in order to do that. So I'm really excited to pass it off to Dr. Levon Deem Null, who's now going to start to identify for you what our action plans will look like. Okay, thank you, Dr. Short. So it is exciting. We collect all of this data. We have a long history in the learning division, but also at all of our buildings to really look at that data and dig in and say, yes, we wanna celebrate, but we also have work to do before I learn. So that's where our action plans come in. So we do a district data dive. So that's a great opportunity where we do a virtual meeting where all schools and teacher leaders, um, principals join and we look at corporation data but then also drill down into school data. So from that data review, then teams get together and they do instructional action plans. So they do a day by day from now until iLearn starts, kind of planning things out and saying, okay, where were those gaps? Where were those certain standards or things that we felt like our kids didn't make the growth of what we know that they need to do? So from there, we create those action plans as teams, add, as grade levels. They share those with the learning division. We love to look at those and see kind of the plans that are happening that are very tailored towards each group of students, right? It's not the same for every third grade at every elementary school or every eighth grade math class and all the middle schools. It is based specifically on that school data. So that's really exciting. And then of course the instructional implementation where they put that, to, it put that into action um, until the iLearn test. So overall, besides that, so that is specific to the data that Dr. Short shared, but we do so much planning all year round with lots of different components and lots of different people. So in all content areas, we are continually looking at, okay, where are the places where we need to grow? We need to improve. And then what does that look like? What are our plans for that? What is what are our, system, what are our systems for that? Because we know that just doesn't happen by happenstance. It has to be very intentional planning. So there's lots of topics up here that we covered, but I'm gonna highlight a couple of key people that play an important role. So our TILT, so there's our teacher leadership teams at the elementary and then instructional leaders at the middle school. So those are teacher leaders who are instrumental at helping teachers plan and institute things within their curriculum to make sure we are making, their, making the growth. So the TILT leaders, instructional leaders are very instrumental in doing writing. I know we talked earlier about grade level meetings where they, we had teachers who presented, shared information about writing. We've had some teachers who have already started the Schmeckens writing to support there, and we will continue to do that and then culminate again, um, I shouldn't say maybe culminate and begin our next step with the great tradition that we have of the Literacy Summit, the 4.0, which we're very excited. Um, we'll pull all of those leaders back together. So I think it's really important to know that over all the, out of all that data, um, we really take it and we use it and we really tailor our plans to help our students based on that that information. So I'm going to talk about another part of professional development that we have with our teachers. Dr. Dean Null. Good evening, everyone. Um, so you're aware that we have a, a major in PD initiative with letters. Um, and so this is a comprehensive teacher development program. Um, we began, gosh, really in the fall with a, an original group of our kindergarten Title I teachers. Um, and upon receiving the Science of Reading Competitive Grant, you know, drastically expanded that. As you can see, we went from 15 participants to 172 participants. Um, our, our Science of Reading Competitive Grant, the award, we were here, we, 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 our initial amount was like 448,000. We got the big check. Well, then they came back and gave us more. <laughs> I don't know where they got it from, uh, but we're pleased. We did receive the highest uh, sum of any school corporation in the state. Um, so to, to share with you uh, our initial cohort, they will conclude uh, really within the next month, that kindergarten group at volume one, uh, and then our science of reading cohort, that goes into summer. That was our, our plan from the get-go, and they'll conclude in August. Um, the, the volume one and volume two, volume one is essentially word recognition, the early phonics skills, 
uh, and then volume two is language comprehension. So vocabulary, fluency, comprehension. Um, and what's great, you know, letters fits the bill in terms of recent legislation for teacher professional development, uh, for what we know is a coming expectation with teacher licensure and a literacy endorsement uh, by July, 2027. Um, one thing to point out that we're excited for, yeah, there's been immediate application. The feedback has been outstanding from our teachers. Um, our dyslexia specialist, Miss Allwine, whom you've met, uh, she's done just a fabulous job. Um, so just the, the energy and feedback around this initiative has been outstanding. I want to yeah. take a minute to really give a shout out to the educators in our Title I buildings. Because one of the things that I love most about this initiative is that they were the pioneers right they led this innovation and and ultimately they tested it out they did to make sure that it worked for us and our students and then they convinced their colleagues to jump on board so i don't think that i'm sure you all had a lot to do with it too i don't doubt it but um i always love sort of stakeholders that are momentum that's built from within the teacher's lounge sure. as opposed to always being top down. And I look at this and that's part of the story that jumps out at me. Yeah. So um, I just wanna thank everybody involved in this top to bottom. And we're obviously all very hopeful that it's gonna move the needle. Yeah, you are not wrong, Mrs. Roach, truly. I mean, the practitioners in the classroom, their voices speak very, very loudly. And so the 15 teachers that were the initial adopters talked very highly of this program, which is why we had 172 teachers or well, an additional 157 that opted in. Remember, this is not a mandate. This is an option for our yeah. teachers. Uh, please express to those 15 my gratitude, admiration. Thank you. Okay. Speaking to preschool, um, we're pleased to share we've had a successful pilot at Madison this school year. Uh, it's been a great learning experience, learning how um, you know, the partnership with the Family and Social Services Administration, um, you know, how that works. Um, our students have showed overwhelming gains. Uh, each of them uh, is showing to be at kindergarten readiness at this point. So they're meeting the, the indicators. We use a program called ESGI for assessment. Um, so we're just really excited. I, I mean, it's the re we, we know what the research says that preschool makes a difference and uh, our own experience has shown preschool makes a difference. Um, so this coming year, we're seeking your approval to expand to a site at Meadows Edge Elementary. Um, Madison and Meadows Edge will be considered targeted Title I preschool programs. So this means uh, that we can use Title I funds uh, to, to partially fund, if you will, these programs or um, Sometimes when you, as I've talked with others in the state who, who run preschool programming, uh, they kind of refer to Title I as a financial runway, if you will, as you're getting programs up and running. Um, so with an improved expansion, our plan would be to hold a night for families to uh, come out to Meadows Edge to apply for CCDF grants. We have um, gotten to know uh, the leadership at Bright Point. Bright Point is the third party contractor the CCDF uses for the whole parent grant process. So they operate in um, from Fort Wayne to the Valpo area, including us. Um, we've gotten to know them and they've shared a, a willingness to come out and help onboard families like on site um, instead of kind of a cumbersome process of having to scan in documents into a portal, wait, get feedback and so on. Um, our plan also would be to have teachers present to provide an academic screener uh, when we, the reason I use the word targeted program is because we're, you know, we're taking one step at a time, right? So um, this program would be able to hold up to 24 students. Um, we, you know, within, within the Meadows Edge territory, there's probably at least 65 kids who are four-year-olds. We know that because that's well about what a, a kindergarten group is. Um, we would not have the space for all of them. So in a targeted program, it allows you to, uh, do screeners, you can uh, use an academic measure, you can look at financial need. And so the idea with Title I is that you're, um, you know, you're providing the resource to the most under-resourced students. Uh, so that would be our intent, um, you know, in, in moving forward with the Meadows Edge program, uh, you know, identifying those who have the highest need. Um, so, oh, see it now, I forgot I had that set on a click. Uh, that's just a, a graph that shares kindergarten readiness. It's substantially filled and we're uh, tickled about that. Um, 
so I've. Um, I'm sorry. Can I yes. ask you one or two questions on that? So can you go back that, to that yeah. ESGI graph? So this is an, an individual component that ESGI measures. This is the overall kindergarten readiness. It's so um, ESGI, uh, it, they are. It's an online assessment. Think of it as a very simplified Dibbles. And so they have some formed assessments that you can do one on one with the student, uh, which is what this is. Kinder readiness. This would include. Uh, letter recognition, letter sound, all the way up to like CBC words decoding. Um, th those are really impressive results. I'll just Thank say you. that. And and what is really promising about this, I, I applaud expanding access in our district to high quality preschool. And um, what we're looking at, what makes it so hopeful to me is I'm actually looking at something that can close disparities and gaps between our district, which we know how important kindergarten readiness is, like where kids start when they begin kindergarten can Absolutely. explain so much of the differences between our schools within yeah. the district. So to see you close that gap, I can understand why you're expanding the Meadows Edge. Um, a couple questions, because I know that there are state requirement. There are a lot of state requirements at the preschool level. I'm sure yes. you understand that since you've been in it. Um, from ratios to proximity to sinks to bathrooms and who can use the bathrooms and who can use the refrigerators and all the like. Do we have the capacity at Meadows Edge yes. to do all that? Like you've obviously evaluated yeah. that, but uh, is it? Yeah, absolutely. Without a doubt. Um, so when it comes to CCDF, they are they are the same agency that um, like if, if you were to run a home daycare, they would go and they would evaluate. Uh, is, are there fire extinguishers present? Is there running water? Those kinds of things. As a function of us being a school, we pretty much naturally meet all those indicators. Right. Right. <clears throat> um, OK, I'm, I'm super excited. Well, thank you. And, um, so just to clarify, this is not a lottery. You all are looking per Title One, per the spirit of Title One. You're looking for yes. kids for whom you think you can make the biggest difference in closing. That's correct, and that's a, that is our our obligation uh, with Title One. Um, the U.S. Department of Education gave updated guidance three weeks ago uh, that. So I, I really think this is an investment. Wayne, thank you for. Preschool is and I'm Wei King and we are super excited to be here at Walt Disney. Yeah, we are also the founders of an organization called Get Your Teach On. We have been so lucky to work with the teachers, the leaders, the students of Walt Disney. What we have seen is uh, throughout our time here is the willingness to know what areas they want to grow in. This year we have had a laser focus on making our writers better. And so with the partnership of Get Your Teach On, we have taught all 530 some of our students this writing chant so um, that they all know the writing process. Our data has also shown great gains in writing and so it's been such a pleasure to see the outcome that our data is showing that the Get Your Teach On writing practices have really helped to improve student writing. We created an engagement lab at Walt Disney to take ordinary standards and content and make them extraordinary. When we walked in, it was kind of like Christmas morning to all of us. Oh my gosh! That's like the it's transformational, so the idea is to bring kids into a space that transforms into different sceneries, to take them to places maybe they've never been, to help spark imagination, to really inspire teachers to be creative and for students to be creative. In this space, teachers can truly take their students anywhere they want to go, whether they want to take them into the world of Toy Story and write from the perspective of a toy, or they want to take them through the jungles of Jurassic Park with the click of a button, they can take their students and immerse them into learning. We can't take all of our students to the mountains or to the beach or to outer space. We can bring that here to them, and experience-driven instruction can be powerful. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> 
who started thinking about different ways to get students writing in this space on different topics. Oh, like what you see right here? Around the, that was a great job to make an observation to help you create an idea. I really want to thank our district leaders for supporting the initiative. Um, we had to build the writing lab in three weeks, and I could not have done that without their support. So I would say I think the response of teachers and students really <laughs> sum it up much better than any justice I could have done to that. Um, so that does bring us to the end of our presentation tonight. But um, Dr. Short, <clears throat> Mr. Towner, and myself, we're happy to answer any questions that you have about anything we shared this evening. Awesome presentation. Board members, any questions or comments? Okay. Well, uh, before I call for a vote, we do have a member of our public who has asked to speak on this particular agenda topic. Uh, familiar face, familiar name, Mr. James Turnwald. Hi, good evening. My name is James Turnwald and I live at 16429 Valley Trail in Mishawaka. My two oldest daughters are currently in fifth and third grade at Meadows Edge. And I'm thrilled to share that my third daughter is about to dive into kindergarten this fall. I'm also very excited by the hard work our third grader put into iRead this year and the services she received through interventions. And um, I don't think we're allowed to officially say, but um, I have a feeling we're going to get really good results on our uh, iRead this year. So uh, my kids are the reason why I'm so passionate about supporting Meadows Edge and PHM schools. As a parent deeply invested in education, I want to express my support for the expansion of the preschool academy to Meadows Edge Elementary. Last year, my wife and I considered enrolling our daughter in the Madison Preschool Academy. Unfortunately, the details and logistics just didn't work out, but I know that is also the case for a few other families. Additionally, the early learning academies at Mary Frank and Horizon are too far north for most Southern families to realistically access. The benefits of early childhood education are well-documented and far-reaching. Research consistently shows that children who participate in high-quality preschool programs exhibit improved cognitive abilities, better social skills, and enhanced academic readiness. These programs can make a big difference in preparing children to succeed in school and lay a strong academic foundation for our little ones. This is a great investment that promises a brighter future for our community and will be a great benefit to families in Penn Township. Expanding the Preschool Academy will offer continuity in our children's educational experience. I just imagine how great it would be for our kids to smoothly transition from preschool to elementary seeing those familiar faces and reducing first aid jitters and to make them feel comfortable and excited about learning. Plus having preschool and elementary education in one place means our educators can collaborate, share ideas and give each kid an even more enriching experience. I do have a few questions about the program. My two questions um, are largely focused on the projected timeline, which I think I heard tonight. Uh, August is coming quick, so I guess my question would be more refined to how will it be promoted? And then my larger question is around what room the new program will be located in, how will that decision impact the overall capacity and enrollment management at Meadows Edge? Will the same quantity of sections per grade level be maintained, or will the trailers in the back of the school have to be used for staff or classroom space? Uh, additionally, I want to make sure that I mention that you know, retaining our existing teachers, especially in a Title I building that has the largest percent of Title students in the entire district is really important. Education isn't just with early education, it's the continuity of all grade levels. And so I view this investment as a great first step, but hopefully there are better ways to retain, uh, additional ways that we can retain all of our uh, amazing staff. We've seen a lot of turnover in the kindergarten. Three minutes have expired, thank you. And I would hope that we could retain those teachers moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Turnwell. Okay, <laughs> board members, any further comment? I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, this is uh, the, uh, just, it's just for Meadows Edge, right? We, we have this at other schools. Preschool? Yeah. Is that your question? Do right. we have preschool? Well, I was school? wondering about the, the transportation issue. I mean, these kids are like four years old or whatever. I mean, 
Oh, how, mm -hmm. is, is that going to be a school bus? Or? I'm happy to address that. So um, this will be a parent transport scenario. So, and that is, um, this would be the second PHM preschool that we would have that would fall under what Mr. Towner described earlier. The two that we have up north are self-supported um, early learning academy programs. So, and those, um, so parents would be providing transportation for students. Yeah, I guess my question would be that since those kids are in, uh, obviously in need, probably um, economically hindered as well, is, is, is do we see any problem with parents being able to get their kids to, or is that going to be one of the conditions that parents are able to bring their kids to school every day or they can't be in a program? So we're going to work through, I'm sure, different situations and scenarios, but one thing that we do know is um, by code in Indiana, if you are four years old, you have to be in, okay, am I right? It's called a BSEE yes. seat, is yeah, that a, a student not enrolled in kindergarten, or not yet kindergarten, uh, essentially like a child seat. Car seat. Um, right. Car seat, if you will, yes. So in that situation, it would require a second individual on the bus in order to um, put the student in and out of the Yes, I want to make sure that kids who can't get there are going to, we're going to make sure that they can get there. I mean, I hate to see one left out because they didn't have transportation. That's my, that's my main concern. Understood. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the Recommendation reconfigure the grade levels of Meadows Edge Elementary to include preschool. I so move. A second. All those in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed, vote nay. Motion carries by vote of six to zero. I want to thank uh, thank all those partic who participated in great presentation. Dr. Short, of course, thank you. Dr. Dean Null, appreciate you always. Doc, uh, Mr. Towner, thank you. Mrs. Higginson, it's great to see you in that video. And speaking of seeing great to see people in the video thank uh, katie carroll for us will you that was a great video um get your teach on over at walt disney elementary school it's been a very exciting project to watch me too me too me too okay we'll move on to our next item which is item number nine a discussion item for field trips dr thacker thank you <coughs> president riley and board of trustees we're very 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 happy to present to the board the middle school presentation on Overseas trip to Europe for the summer of 2025. Joining us to present this evening is Discovery Middle School counselor, Ms. Abby Harder Lopez, and apparently Dr. Dean Null. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I will turn this over to Dr. Short and she'll introduce the other 12 speakers. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you, Dr. Thacker, President Riley, members of the board. Very exciting potential upcoming trip. Um, and yes, Dr. Levon Dean Null will formally introduce um, Mrs. Abby Carter Lopez, who will be one of the trip sponsors. Yeah, good evening. So good to share with you on a different topic this evening. Um, if you remember recently, we did approve some of our very popular trips. So the middle school Japan trip that will be going this summer, then also a couple high school trips that we are very excited to look at. We've traditionally gone that every other year, kind of to Asia, to Europe. So we are back to Europe in 2025. So I'm very excited. Um, so Mrs. Carter Lopez is gonna share with you that trip to Paris, Provence and Barcelona. Yeah. Hello, good evening, President Riley, Dr. Thacker, and member of the board. Um, thank you for having me tonight. We are very excited to share this opportunity for the middle school students. Um, we would like to propose a trip abroad to um, Paris, Provence, France, and Barcelona, Spain for the summer of 2025. Here's the agenda for this evening, um, just a little bit of what we'll talk about, academic connections, the itinerary, travel dates, um, group specifics, preparing the travel, and then safety and support. So here at P PHM, we have been facilitating experiences abroad since 2009, so 11 trips um, abroad at this point. We have traveled to different countries, such as China, France, Germany, to name a few, and this summer, the middle school students will be traveling to Japan. So we would um, like to open up this trip to sixth and seventh grade students currently in sixth and seventh grade now, um, middle school students who are in good standing. Preparing lifelong learners who can ad adapt to a changing world remains an important part of the Penn Harris Madison's mission. Uh, an experience abroad helps students to be prepared for their futures. 
here is um, just a short list of the Indiana academic standards and how they can relate to the middle school curriculum. Here's a snapshot of our travel. We'll fly into Paris, um, venture through France to Provence and end in Barcelona, Spain. This is just a short look at the itinerary. That's a seven day trip. We'll start on June 24th and end July 1st of 2025. Um, this is an idea of what the group specifics might be like. In the past, we've had anywhere from 40 to 100 travelers. Um, we just want to make it clear that space is limited and it will be on a first come first served basis. So in preparation for travel, we'll have monthly meetings for parents and students to have the opportunity to learn, um, support, and prepare for travel. And that will include a half day um, where students and parents can come and have like a cultural experience day. Um, they'll have a lot of team building sessions as well. We'll be using Explorica by World Strides. This is a travel company that um, PHM has worked with for many years. They have over 50 years of experience. Um, they, the tour directors provide 24 seven on tour support for the travelers. Um, they work and live in the cities and they speak all the local languages of where, we'll, where we will be. They will also be our safety partner. They go above and beyond. They have a global presence in many cities and on many continent, continents. Um, and they have a can you can cancel for any reason with their travel protection plans. Here's just a list of everything that Explorica offers. Um, the payments or the costs for students will be just over four thousand um, dollars. That will include the um, uh, protection plan. They offer flexible payment options, and Explorica also offers um, a personal tour donation page for students and families to donate to. Thank you. Do you have any questions for me? Board members, questions or comments? I'm a perennial question. Do we get to go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the students, like I said, we are going to open it up to um, the students first and see how many students oh, yeah. are. We didn't really. Oh, <laughs> I was like, I can give you logistics if you'd like. But yes, parents can go. <laughs> Since 2009, board members have asked that question. The answer is always no. Oh, yeah. No. I appreciate your response. Frank. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Harder Lopez. Board members, any questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, do I have a motion to authorize the planning and preparation for the middle school student teacher trip to Europe on June 24th through July 1st, 2025, as presented? I so move. I second. All those in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed, vote nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you again, Dr. Short. Thank you, Dr. Dean Null. And thank you so much, Ms. Harder Lopez, for presenting this information to the board. Looks like an absolutely wonderful trip. It's going to be great for our students. We'll move on to instruction reports. Dr. Thacker. Thank you, President Riley and Board of Trustees. We're pleased to present to the board the Penn High School Academy, focusing on the STEM Academy. So we're going to have with us tonight, Assistant Principal Josiah Parker, STEM Academy leader, Ms. John Gensick, and several STEM Academy students, which is always fun. And Dr. Short will introduce the slide for us. Thank you, Dr. Thacker, President Riley, members of the board. Yes, very excited this evening to welcome both Mr. Josiah Parker as well as Mr. John Gensick. And I know they have some fabulous students here with us. Um, I think you will be amazed at what our STEM programming is happening, what's going on with our students and what they're able to do with it. So welcome. Thank you, Dr. Short. Uh, good evening, Dr. Thacker, President Riley, members of the board. I'm really excited to be here uh, as always to present some amazing things that are happening at the high school. I had a, a kind of a long spiel about some, some jokes I was going to give Noah a hard time again. He didn't have to do it with my attire, but the kids have been waiting out here for a long time, very patiently. So I'm going to skip all that and let them go and let them talk for themselves because that's kind of what we're all here for as the kids anyway. So um, I'll just go ahead and introduce our STEM Academy leader, Mr. John Gensick. Uh, he's been in this position for several years and keeps helping push the way through and create some great opportunities for our high school students in the STEM Academy. 
Dr. Thacker, President Ryan, members of the board, and you see the goal we have here, and let's let's get to it. Um, we're, we're, there's a lot to be thankful for in the STEM Academy. I had this slide last year. Transportation is vital to get our students out in, to places, whether it's the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, whether it's to place in Mishawaka, whether it's to elementary schools to help plant trees. You can see the pictures here. Another thing to be thankful for is the Education Foundation. They help get us money to plant a lot of orchards across the district. And this past year was a phenomenal year for the fruit trees, especially at Elm Road. Uh, the fifth grade teacher down there was able to harvest a lot of fruit and do some different things in the classroom. And we're looking, because of collaboration with the Education Foundation and Pen Grown, to be able to move some fresh fruits and vegetables through the Penn School Food Pantry to students uh, who otherwise wouldn't be able to get it. And so all those things up there, the Education Foundation does for us, we're there very thankful for, along with all the volunteers and mentors we have. New things this year, we, we had Jim Langfelt clear some land at a property and he gave us a bunch of logs. And uh, I had done this project at my folks' house where a portable sawyer came out and we were able to mill boards in front of the students with Dan Vogelsang's classes and some biology classes, some other, other courses to be able to see it happen, turning logs into boards. And right now they're seasoning to be able to be used in the classrooms in the, in the near future as they dry out. Um, so I'm excited for that. We'll see what other kind of opportunities open up because of other logs that become available to us. Uh, the greenhouse has seen revitalization because of the Education Foundation's investment. Uh, you can see some potatoes and tomato plants being grown there. The Building Trades house is coming along wonderfully. And in chemistry, we have new distillation equipment that has been uh, about to be put into use by Mr. McClellan's ICP classes. Since the last board meeting, we've had a lot of robotic success. Um, not only the quality robot award, but just recently another blue banner uh, earned by the students in 135 down at Plainfield. Mr. Marsh, Mr. Shellhart, Ms. Fielding are, are crushing it. There's been no letdown uh, with the change in robotics coaching. All of these I could talk for a long time about, and you're going to hear a little bit about one or two today, but we're going places doing things. The the thankfulness to the, to the Education Foundation for funding some of this, to the PTO for supporting some other projects, and transportation for being able to help us go places that otherwise we wouldn't be able to go to. Um, I'll highlight a couple of them here. One is we took two charter buses to Peoria, Illinois, because a Body Worlds exhibit was on display there that had been in Scranton, Pennsylvania the year before, and is only in a couple different places across the globe. And uh, Ms. Zerfus wanted to go to Pennsylvania, and then we saw that it was coming to Illinois, so then we planned, put it on our calendar to go down to Illinois, and it happened to be right next to Caterpillar Visitor Center, so we could see a whole bunch of different STEM things all within walking distance of each other. There's a Holocaust Memorial at the same spot, so it was just a, a great experience to see a bunch of different things in downtown Peoria, and then Taylor will talk more about this Harris Township Park project in a second. Just last week, Zach Lopez, Fabian Lopez, Stephen Sanders were uh, were recognized for being aspiring new new teachers to the profession in their first five years of teaching, and were able to go to Denver to go to the Science Teacher Association National Conference. And all of our STEM staff are, are worthy of recognition, but these three were recognized last week in Denver. We have students who go to Harper Cancer Center every summer and participate in their research projects. We have students on campus in Notre Dame through different professors who are, are wonderful to work with. Um, and some I've already talked about with the trees and the Harris Township project. Uh, and Zach Lopez and Michelle Miller and Kotar Biology, they work with the local fish hatchery to, to raise up salmon that people in our community fish for regularly. And I'm excited to go charter fishing later this spring as well. So with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Anika Min to talk about her experiences specifically, and then we have two other students after that. So Anika, come on forward. Hello, I'm Anika, and I'm a senior this year at Penn. Um, I'm also the president of Penn Medical Club. This club offers opportunities to fellow students to pursue and expand their interest in the medical field. And this is done through um, professional speakers, dissections, and then activities that we create catering to our members' interests. Some STEM classes that I've taken are AP Chemistry, AP Biology, and I'm currently in my fourth year at P 
PLCW biomedical science pathway that is offered here. Um, I've had the opportunity to have lab experience over at Notre Dame for the past two summers, and the skills and knowledge that I've acquired at Penn have helped me become su successful in this lab. Currently, I'm planning on going to IU and majoring in neuroscience. I feel like Penn has helped me find a passion in pursuing a pre-med path, and the classes in the various clubs that are offered here all help further my interest and set me up to success in college, which I will start. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, we have a uh, William. Come on forward. I'm William Simmons. I've been in STEM programs all four years of my high school career. I'm a senior at Penn. Uh, these classes have helped me in my high school, both academically and in my future plans. I've been in four classes in the engineering pathway, including the capstone course, Engineering Development and Design. And I also spent a year in manufacturing and robotics. These classes have helped me not only in my academic career, but also in my choice of college and my major and in communi connecting with people who can help me in my further, uh, further endeavors. These programs help narrow down my path in engineering to mechanical engineering, as I found that I, was, that I enjoyed mechanical engineering, the intricate nature of mechanical design, and the interaction between mechanical systems. My courses at Penn have helped me prepare not only for my future career, but also my further education at Purdue University. We had two seniors, and I also wanted to give a the give Sim Academy viewed not just from somebody who's been all the way through it, but then a, a sophomore. So Taylor, come on down. Hello, President Riley, Dr. Thacker, members of the board. Um, I'm so honored to speak with you about STEM at Penn tonight, um, specifically about our agriculture program. Um, a little about me, um, my name's Taylor, I'm a sophomore, um, and I'm looking into a career involving conservation. Um, my agriculture classes have helped me learn um, about nature in general, and I've really enjoyed working with um, Miss Sparrow, our agriculture teacher, and hearing about her experiences in the field. Um, as part of this class, we helped with a prairie restoration project um, in Harris Township by the library, um, transplanting native plants, which was very educational. Even though it was 50 degrees and pouring rain, um, <laughs> I still had fun um, learning about the process of rebuilding a prairie. Penn has helped me so much to discover what I want to do in the future and learn more about it. I'm looking forward to taking advanced life science next year and continuing my work with Penn FFA as a club officer. Thank you. There were four other adults out there that day to help move plants, and it was inspiring to see the students' energy to like get it done in the middle of that rain. And there's a question going into the day, moving these plants out of the way of this path. So if you're ever up there and you want to go down a trail, pretty soon there'll be a trailhead sign, so go down that, go down that path and check it out. Uh, but we were wondering, how are we going to water these plants, right? Because there's no water at that park. And then the the weather was perfect to <laughs> and, and make a, a tough day a little bit easier so here you can see it, all the different offerings we've got in stem academy where there's ap acp and dual credit classes along with these after school programs and extracurriculars that help us to to meet the needs of all different learners um the goal as stated up there that's an ambitious goal right to have to have a stem literate citizenry that's a that's tough and STEM can be used for, for not so good a purpose, STEM can be used for good purposes, and we do our best to try to have our students be aware of uh, the good that can be done and academically accomplish at high levels. And I'll always say there's more work to do, and we're thankful for your continued support. And with that, I, I thank you for your time. We thank you for your time. <laughs> Mr. Parker and Mr. Ginsick. STEM has achieved so much. Thank you guys both for all that you've done to make STEM what it is today. It is certainly a beacon program at PHM. And Anika and William, we know next year when you graduate and you go on to IU and Purdue respectively that you're going to excel in neuroscience and medical engineering. No question about that. And Taylor, thank you for coming out tonight and giving us your experience and your observations as a sophomore and kind of make us a promise though you come back 
in your senior year and tell us how it ended? Okay, you guys did a great job. We love hearing from our students and wish you the best. Mr. Ginsick? I forgot to thank uh, Mundo O'Malley for all the work she's done to prepare staff K through 12 for the eclipse. Oh, on Monday. oh yeah. And uh, the plans we have and the plans we react to are just, uh, it's an opportunity to get out. I've been with my family to the last eclipse. Um, we were fortunate to be there. I know that a lot of people have a lot of commitments and their safety concerns, but if you get a chance to be with your family on that day and go check it out, I highly encourage it. Uh, when we were down there, like shivers down the spine of all my kids when we think about like seeing totality like we saw it seven years ago. Mm -hmm. Melinda will say, we hope for clear skies, definitely hope for clear skies, but otherwise uh, it'll be dark in the middle of the day in a way that I never experienced as a kid. Some of us saw an annular eclipse when we were maybe in fifth grade or something, but that's not a total eclipse. And I distinctly know the difference and Melinda's passion for it has been infectious to me. So to support her work and and trying to inspire the activity that you guys have supported to maybe help more families and to go is, is noble. And to be able to highlight her efforts, I think I needed to take that opportunity to, to thank Melinda for everything she's done. So, so noted. Thank you for pointing that out. Great to see you. Okay, we'll move on to our next item, which is approval of the Yeoman Family Plaza. Dr. Thacker. Thank you, President Riley and Board of Trustees. So this item was first brought before the board at the February 26th meeting in accordance with policy 9700.01 sponsorships. The administration presents for a second reading the PHM Education Foundation's naming rights campaign request for the plaza located at Penn High School's TCU Free Field to the board for approval. The PHM Education Foundation requests that the board approve the naming rights campaign to add the signage Yeoman Family Plaza to the plaza at Penn High School's TCU Free Field. The naming rights will be effective August 1st, 2024. It will last for 12 years. Thank you, Dr. Thacker. Board members, any questions or comments? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the Yeoman Family Plaza naming rights agreement with Penn Harris Madison Education Foundation for sponsorship of the plaza at Penn High School's TCU Freed Field as presented? I so move. I second. All those in favor, vote aye. 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 Any opposed, vote nay. Motion carries unanimously. Sure look forward to that going into place. We'll move on to our second business action item of this evening, Dr. Thacker. Thank you, President Riley and Board of Trustees. Uh, Chief Operating Officer Dr. Aaron Lutz is going to share a request for approval of the construction of the Penn High School Fieldhouse Project. I think we're taking it through. Yeah, we will. Thank you, Dr. Thacker. Good evening, President Riley, members of the board. Uh, we are very excited about this presentation this evening. Uh, for over 20 years, we've discussed the expansion of space to support the academic, athletic, extracurricular, and co-curricular activities on campus. And this is something that's going to just be a, a, such a value add for our families and our community as a whole. Um, because our students have such a wide spectrum of abilities and talents and interests, so we want to be able to meet all of those. But before we start, as a reminder, we've already handled the uh, financial piece of this, but I do want to remind our, our members of the audience that this investment does not raise taxes in PHM. We are excellent uh, in excellent fiscal health, and we are dedicated to fiscal responsibility, as we've shown in all of our improvements. Uh, that being said, there were some things that we aimed to try to get done uh, with this project that we weren't able to afford. And, uh, but, but through uh, strategic design, uh, we're well prepared in the future to continue, if, if needed, in the future, add on to this building and do some great things. Uh, remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. So uh, just so that we temper all expectations. Uh, Mike Chip uh, designed uh, the uh, building for us. He's with Fannie Howie. He's present here tonight, uh, as well as PHM parent. Uh, Troy Madlam uh, with Magnus Engineering, uh, they provided us the most uh, economical building uh, plan so that we could maximize those dollars in this investment in our school community. Uh, as you recall, we began the process, uh, the process back in July uh, with the design work. We completed all the financial requirements in the fall. And so this evening, this is the very last step, and that's approving the contractor. Uh, but before we do that, we would like to share a, a video uh, of the field house so you can walk through and, and see what uh, we are looking forward to sharing with our community. So I'd like to present the uh, Penn Kingsman field house and it's gonna walk uh, us through that. You might wanna turn the lights down just slightly. Um, this new facility will increase our ability for uh, act, providing more active learning spaces for our students. 
Uh, this will happen before the school day, during the school day, after the school day, weekends. Uh, this place, much like the rest of Penn High School, will never sleep. Uh, it's going to help support the academic programming, but it's actually going to increase just the space availability for all students. We talk about that co-curricular, extracurricular, uh, fine arts, academics, uh, sports. It's really going to meet the needs of, of all students in PHM. <coughs> Uh, we know that more space equals more opportunity, and we know that uh, it, more opportunity increases participation, and more participation increases student success in the classroom. So uh, we're looking forward to that connectivity. So the new field house will have a six-lane, 200-meter track. The uh, lanes are wide enough for hurdles, some of the challenges <coughs> at some places. We appreciate that, Mike. Uh, we did a lot of investigative work to make sure that we talked to schools who have built field houses to find out what pitfalls they had and we tried to address all of those. It's also gonna be able to support all indoor field events, uh, pole vault, long jump, high jump, shot put, all those things can uh, be going on while we're still running on the track uh, safely, I might add. Um, <clears throat> the uh, construction uh, will also support uh, activities like baseball, softball, golf. We've got hitting nets that will be able to be brought down in that multi-surface area so that you can do some hitting. Uh, you're looking right now at a at a, a hallway lookout that oversees it. So if you think about the marching band or robotics or any sport or activity that requires coaches to be up above to see what's going on and how the movement works, uh, they'll be able to be there. Uh, it's gonna support, uh, obviously, uh, basketball, volleyball, tennis, all those things that happen indoors. It's two wood courts, two multi-surface courts. Um, so it's very flexible to meet the, the range of needs for all of our programming. Uh, it will have, when it's completed, four locker rooms. It's going to have two classrooms with a movable wall. It will have an athletic training room, bleacher seating for over 800 people, and uh, storage uh, to support all the equipment so that we can use the field house and not have to take a portion of the field house just to store the equipment that we want in it. So uh, a lot of great things. You'll also have a security office, a concession stand, all the normal things that you need for an activity center uh, such as this. And most importantly, event parking which as we may need in the future, more student parking, uh, we'll be able to park some students over there. Uh, the construction will not impact the daily operations of Penn High School uh, because of where it's located. It'll be located uh, between, if, if you're looking visually at, at McKinley Highway, right by the new Culver's, which I'm sure most of you have already visited or may visit this evening, uh, and the uh, new uh, fire station uh, the, back behind there, uh, PHM owns that land and that's where that will be constructed. So without uh, further ado, uh, we would like to recommend the uh, contract for the Penn High School Fieldhouse, the lowest and most responsive bidder, which is R. Yoder Construction. It's a local bidder out of Napanee uh, for a base bid of $14,741,535. And alternates number one for a south parking lot, number three for the uh, residence flooring in the locker rooms that helps with slips, trips, and falls. Uh, and the restrooms, uh, number four for the operable wall between the classrooms, number six for the interior metal uh, panel, and number eight for that support addition for all that storage that we're gonna need for all the great activities that are gonna take place. So the total award is $15,926,745. We included a letter of recommendation as well as the bid specs. We had, a, we really appreciate all of our local bidders. We had five, it was very, uh, it was a very good turnout. Mike, I really appreciate all the work Fanning Howie has done on behalf of the district uh, to make this a possibility. He designed a building. He said he was going to do it uh, under budget, and he was successful. So I appreciate that. Happy to answer any questions. Remember, is there any questions or comments? Well, I guess, is he going to be able to meet the timeline? Yeah, great question. So the timeline, it, obviously, they want to begin immediately. Uh, the biggest question on that property is what kind of soil conditions we have. So the first step, which I would imagine we're having a, we're, the meeting's already planned. We're meeting uh, this week uh, with the contractor. The first thing they'll do is, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Kenzikan, if you're still here, uh, we don't have a lot of great trees on that property. Most of it's uh, scrub trees. So we won't be able to use uh, some of those, uh, as he indicated, for our STEM activities. But some we may, and we will, if we can. First thing they'll do is they're gonna clear the lot uh, so that we can get to the soil so we can determine uh, how much of the budget we have left. Uh, we do have some uh, dollars built in for potential soil problems as you would with any kind of construction. And so that will teeter first. So we will begin immediately and the goal is to have substantial completion uh, for the start of the 25, 26 school year. Well, I think he probably draws his health from a different area than what all these stuff. <clears throat> 
I think, uh, you know, in, in total, when in working with, uh, in speaking with them, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, they've got, I don't know how many total different subcontractors will be working on this. I mean, it's, I don't know the it's, a, it's an extensive list, and they do. They draw from other areas they because, from... as you're aware, we've got more than this project going on this summer. And so uh, our Yoder has not uh, done significant work for us in this capacity, but they have done significant work in the area. Uh, they're very reputable, uh, great company. And uh, we're certainly pleased uh, with their bid and their partnership. It's going to be a great project. And there'll be lots <clears> of, <throat> of uh, companies locally impacted by this. Other questions or comments? Hearing none, do I have a motion to award the contract for construction of the Penn High School Fieldhouse to R. Yoder Construction, Inc. of Napanee for a base bid of $14,741,535 and alternates number one, number three, number four, number six, and number eight for a total award of $15,926,745 as presented. I so move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Vote nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Dr. Linsky. And we look forward to the project being completed. It's an exciting project done, for us. Absolutely. <laughs> They're starting right now, nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's keep moving. We'll go on to item 12.03, which is approval of professional services agreement for capital improvements. Dr. Thack. Thank you, President Riley and Board Trustees. Chief Operating Officer Dr. Erlinski will continue with our next item, which has, which has an approval of a professional services agreement. Thanks, Dr. Thacker. Good evening once again. Uh, we're asking for your approval for professional services to evaluate, recommend, and assist us with the specification and bid documents uh, related to capital improvements for audio and visual enhancements at the uh, Penn Arena Gym, as well as an auditorium. If you've uh, been in those areas, you know that we need a little help in the, in, uh, with our sound systems. Uh, TPC is who we're recommending. They actually helped design the original sound systems some components that are still active today from the late 80s. Uh, so we're looking forward to working with them. Uh, they have a long standing in the district. Uh, we're uh, hopeful that uh, this uh, improvements can be made this summer. So we're recommending the agreement be approved for $10,000. Thank you, Dr. Linsky. Any questions or comments? Do I have a motion to approve the professional services agreement with TPC Technologies, Inc. to review existing audio visual systems design improvements and prepare bid documents for both Penn High School Arena and Natatorium for a total fee of $10,000 as presented. I so move. Second. All those, in, all those in favor vote aye. 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 Any opposed vote nay. We'll show that as carrying unanimously. I do want to keep the meeting going expeditiously. But a couple of school board members, including myself, have indicated that we need to take a quick break. So we're going to take a five minute break and we'll be right back on the record.
agenda is the hearing of visitors. At regular board meetings, the public is invited to address the board on general topics under the hearing of visitors without registering. A time limit of three minutes shall be enforced for persons wishing to speak during the hearing of visitors. Board Attorney Mr. Jeff Johnson will keep time and will let you know as your time is expiring. It is requested that you state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. Individuals may speak once, only, uh, only once during this section of the agenda. Please understand the personnel issues absolutely cannot be addressed during open sessions of the board. BHM as an employer must comply with our own policies as well as certain employment laws. BHM has a clearly defined procedure for personnel issues that is concerns about individual employees of the district should be brought to the superintendent or to his designee. I do encourage any member of the board who has a personnel issue to follow that procedure. Please use orderly and appropriate language and volume when addressing the board. Also, this is an opportunity for members of the public to address the board as a whole. Please refrain from directing your remarks to other members of the public or individually singling out board members. I respectfully request anybody wishing to address the board abide by this policy. With those provisos in mind, who'd like to address the board? My name is Brent Curtis and I have two children in the PHM schools. They say you can't help those who don't want to be helped. But I'm here to implore this board to not only accept help, but to actually seek it. These meetings are becoming increasingly contentious. During the last meeting, President Riley called a fellow board member unprofessional. Now that label could apply to several people and numerous actions of this board, but that's a topic for another day. When parents, as well as some board members speak at these meetings, they are greeted by a mix of disdain and indignance. It is always from the same group and it's undeniable. This particular group lacks a few characteristics that are prohibiting you from gaining support. Humility. Humility is defined as a modest or low view of one's own importance. Some of you think you're better than others. You are often smug and condescending. It causes tension and creates a confrontational atmosphere. Self-awareness. Self-awareness allows a person to recognize limitations and admit mistakes. Acknowledging faults and shortcomings is not a sign of failure or inability. It's a sign of confidence and leadership. Leadership exists in behavior, not titles or power. Mutual respect. Mutual respect means treating others with dignity and recognizing their worth. Everyone in this room has value you should welcome their input. Open-mindedness. Open-mindedness means being willing to consider new or different viewpoints without being defensive, judgmental, or biased. You are quick to reject anyone who questions or contradicts you. Learn to accept and invite a diversity of opinions. There's an old saying, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So if you'd like to receive less criticism, do something different. Alter your approach, revise your thinking, temper your attitudes. I could suggest considering new officers. Dissolving this little clique would help resolve or restore the public's faith and trust. And it might rejuvenate your collective enthusiasm for the work you are here to do. Ultimately, we all win or lose together. But a win is not possible unless you recognize the need for changes and are willing to make them. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. Who's next? Anybody else? Mrs. Cartwright? Tina Cartwright. Um, you know, not really sure <clears throat> what you guys are doing here with all your rule changes. You are turning our school board into a laughing stock. Your behavior is embarrassing and you're acting like whiny little children throwing tantrums to get your way. I've watched you change and twist and remove rules over the last year, all to fit your agenda and interests. Rules that you never cared about before. Never, I've been coming to board meetings for years. Never have I seen this. But when you're met with a little resistance, you can't handle it and have to find some way to silence people. You're trying to silence fellow board members, which in return 
is silencing parents and community members. Oh wait, you prefer the term stakeholders. Parents and community members that voted for them to be in the seats that are right next to yours. You're bas you basically admitted that this current change was regarding the gentleman third from the left. Last I remember, there was a policy regarding retaliation in PHM. Oh wait, just like Mr. Dallas said, the rules must not apply to you. <coughs> I remember speaking to you after your debate against Brian Jones. I said I appreciated the candor and that is what we needed more of. You assured me that we would have more roundtable discussions to encourage communication. That was about 18 months ago and I've yet to hear about any of these actually taking place, let alone participate in any. You treat each other so poorly, you bully, you talk down to one another, and you're disrespectful. You're supposed to be the leaders of our school system and you are not leading by example. At the very least, you should hold yourselves to the standards that you expect out of the students in this district. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cartwright. Who's next? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to board reports and requests. Board members, as a reminder, we have a 10 minute limit per board member and we are governed under Robert's Rules of Decorum. I'd like to um, allot myself my, my time and Mr. Johnson, let me know when I'm at around eight minutes. I want to address an issue that has come up at previous school board members, at school board meetings that involves a video and the school board and the administration's response to the video. The time is now appropriate for me to say something about it because the investigation surrounding the video has concluded. And I'll explain what I'm talking about in just a minute. On September 15th, 2023, a member of the community posted a video. The video was disturbing at the least. As a result of the video being posted, the administration decided to deliver a letter to the video maker instructing him not to come back on school property. After receiving that letter, the individual who made the video then filed a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights and he alleged retaliation. Thereafter, the Office of Civil Rights issued a determination after conducting an investigation and found on March 14th that there was insufficient evidence of any retaliation and the Office of Civil Rights dismissed this individual's complaint. That's the timeline of events. I have been very hesitant to say anything while the investigation was underway. I think I made a few remarks at Walt Disney Elementary, but on, beyond that, I've let the investigation take place. It's now time to discuss the video and why the school district acted in response the way it acted. When I previously made remarks at Walt Disney, a few members of the public quibbled with me about my choice of describing what happened in the video. I'm not going to use my own words to describe what happened in the video. I'm going to use the words that the investigator concluded and put in the investigator's determination. The investigator concluded that on September 15, 2023, parent A posted a video on social media depicting guns, blood, and bullets directed at corporation personnel. Parent A's video showed the school board's president face superimposed over a character from a movie with multiple bullets shot at the character. That school board president is me. That was my face that was superimposed on a character, on a character who was having bullets shot at. Some people have said it wasn't a video, it was a meme. Some people said it wasn't bullets, it was words. Well, don't take my word for it. Take the word from the OCR investigator who investigated the retaliation complaint and came to the conclusion it was guns, blood, and bullets. The opening frame of the video is particularly disturbing as a semi-automatic gun slowly turns toward the viewer and fires. The next frame is just a red blood background with PHM on it. We are not going to take any 
potential threat of violence, particularly gun violence, lightly, especially from somebody who has the audacity to post it publicly. We would be irresponsible in our duties. Questions have come up as to information that was reported to help the law enforcement investigation of this individual. And you're exactly right. We are going to pr we're provide as much information to law enforcement as law enforcement needs so that law enforcement can make an informed decision. And I was the one who directed a PHM employee to do so. And for the sake and safety of our students, for our parents, for our community members, I would do it again. Anytime that there is a video depicting guns, blood, and bullets, anytime that there is a video depicting a member of the school board or the administration being shot at, we are going to take it seriously. In early December, law enforcement made the decision that the video did not rise to the level of a criminal act, and that's law enforcement's decision. After law enforcement issued that decision, the administration rescinded the no contact order. However, I strongly support what the administration did from the time that this video was posted until the time that law enforcement it indicated that the criminal investigation was no longer pending. Because, as I indicated, whenever there are guns, blood, and bullets directed at PHM, we are going to take it seriously. We're going to assist law enforcement. We're going to do everything that we can to ensure the safety of the people who come here, attend here, and work here. I will reserve the balance of my time. Any other school board members? Yes. Mr. Chaffee. Thank you. Due to the very serious nature of this matter that I am about to address, I have a prepared written statement that I will read. I have sought legal counsel from my attorneys and others whose opinions I value. In the past two weeks, we received a document regarding an APRA request that Mr. Ben Dallas sought. This document, an email from the PHM Director of Communications to our board president, Chris Riley, is dated November 2nd, 2023, and includes the multiple page attachment that I have referenced at several previous meetings. We finally have that answer as to who the individual was behind it. He said it just a few minutes ago. It was our board president, Mr. Chris Riley. I have been forthcoming publicly in this matter about getting to the bottom of this, and it is very well documented over the past several months. I am appalled at the failed effort to politically persecute a parent who has been critical of this school corporation. I have often heard from many, President Riley included, about the seriousness of being elected as a trustee and the duties that accompany it. As he has said, our children are watching us. It is imperative that we conduct ourselves with dignity and respect for others. This is true. Our children are watching us. But today is not about Ben Dallas or a certain set of parents. This is about what President Riley and others on his behalf are willing to do to harm those who are critical of him. This is just one example. I have and am aware of more instances of President Riley's willingness to harm others who criticize him. The triangle is broken. There is no trust between a high percentage of this community and this school district because of him. There is only one way forward to build back that trust. Tonight, I am calling on President Riley to resign from his position as a school board trustee. The timeline of events that leads us to where we are at today with this statement is all very accessible to the public. What astounds me is that over the last several months, President Riley sat here while we asked these questions, knowing the answers, and trying to conceal this information. At no point in time did he inform the entire board of his actions. 
that would concern them. Mr. Garrett, Mr. Beeler, and I all sought to get to the bottom of this. Three board members elected by the people of this community asking for honest answers. Mr. Beeler has served on the school board for 38 years. Mr. Garrett has served on this board for eight years. And prior to that, he taught and coached at PHM for 43 years. President Riley didn't care to honestly answer his fellow board members questions when he knew the answers. President Riley lives by the elitist attitude of rules for thee, but not for me. He failed to inform three elected officials of his actions. At this point, it is a fair assumption that trustees Sullivan, Roach, and McCullough, along with Superintendent Thacker, were aware of what Mr. Riley was doing due to their continued support in hiding the answers <clears throat> to these questions. This is much bigger than one individual parent. President Riley has abused his power in a way that seeks to silence those who speak out against him. This clandestine mode of operation at PHM has to be put to a stop. Students, parents, teachers, administrators, and support staff fear retaliation from the school corporation for speaking out and rightly so. That's because of President Riley. I'm calling on his resignation here tonight immediately. True leaders own up to mistakes. They apologize. When needed, they take further action. Tonight, further action is needed for the healing process to begin. It starts with President Riley's resignation. Thank you, and no, I do not yield back the rest of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chaffee. Any other school board members wish to be recognized? Yeah, I have a few things I'd like to clear up. <clears throat> Mr. Garrett? You know, a few weeks ago, when all this started, and uh, there were questions being asked about what was going on, uh, there, we were warned that by asking questions like that, that could be construed as interfering with the investigation. Do you remember that? Does everybody remember that? Yeah. And that, that you could possibly be um, charged with a felony. Okay. So if asking questions about an investigation is uh, considered interference, what about a school board member going to the uh, person's uh, employer uh, with information and obviously an attempt to get him fired, is that not an interference of the investigation? Mm -hmm. Or how about uh, another school board member uh, ordering or asking our uh, communications director to compile, do a deep dive into the <coughs> um, social media accounts of our this person who has uh, had the uh, non-trespass order uh, put on him, uh, and then taking that and apparently uh, opening a new investigation because the original investigation, we all understand the original part, no question. There was a question about the uh, video. You did the um, no trespass. We had the uh, investigation. There was, uh, it was found to be non-criminal. Um, um, at that point, his rights should have been reinstated. And it should have been over. But at that point, it wasn't over. It was at that point where the additional video uh, searches were done. And uh, apparently, uh, Mr. Redman, a county sheriff, was involved. And uh, it was taken to the prosecutor. But uh, we've never found out, though, who the prosecutor, uh, uh, who investigated this at the prosecutor's office. We were never uh, told what uh, um, role Mr. Redmond played. Uh, we were never told if this information was ever actually given to the prosecutor, or maybe it was just something that was used to prolong uh, punishing Mr. Dallas. So that's, a, a, to me, that's a lingering uh, story that I would like to have eventually a transparency on that so we really know what actually happened. You know, who uh, actually, uh, according to an email I've seen, excuse me, it was uh, our president who asked for the documentation to be assembled. So I'm assuming then there was the president who took the information or gave it to the police or the prosecutor's attorney, a prosecutor, whoever it was given to. And uh, that was how it continued. All I know is 
We understand, and I understand completely, the first problem, okay? You had an issue with the video. Um, we did the uh, no trespass. We did the investigation, and then it should have been finished, but it wasn't. So the part that went on and further, and it's what, you, could, you didn't punish him enough, you had to punish him some more. So I, I, wanna, I wanna know who ordered the uh, uh, documentations to be put together by our uh, communications director? How, who contacted or got in touch with Mr. Redmond, if anybody did? Uh, who took it to the prosecutor's office? Who at the prosecutor's office or the sheriff's department or whoever did that second investigation? And when was it finally told that he was okay? And then we finally let him uh, come back to, to the PHM event. So if, if we could clear that up with me, uh, that would solve a lot. I, that would make me feel a lot better just knowing exactly what happened. So that's still information we don't know. And that's, and that's uh, that kind of sticks in my craw. If that's something that we're, that's, we're not being transparent on that. And I'd like to know why. And I do not yield back my time either. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Any other school board members? Okay, hearing none. Now move on to announcements. Next regular meeting of the Penn Harris Madison Board of School Trustees will convene on Monday, April the 22nd, 2024 at 7 p.m. at Schmucker Middle School. There being no further action before the board, do I have a motion to adjourn tonight's regular meeting of the Penn Harris Madison Board of School Trustees? I so move. Second. All those in favor vote aye. 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 Any opposed vote nay. Motion carries unanimously. We're adjourned at 9.27 p.m.